What, is there a definition of disabled when we're talking about this? When we're talking about disability, for, to qualify for um, SSDI maybe, um, you have to be able to show that you are unable to engage in substantial gainful employment. So for me as a lawyer, if something happened to me and uh, I was no longer to act as an attorney, um, I probably could not qualify for disability just on the fact that I can't act as an attorney because there probably could be a lot of other things I could still do. So maybe I could still uh, be a uh, maid or uh, flip hamburgers at McDonald's. Um, any number of things I might still be able to do. So to be disabled to qualify for these benefits, you've got to show that you're substantially unable to maintain gainful employment for a period of at least six months and that's going to continue for at least a year or end in your death. So it's really somebody who is, who's, who's completely unable to, mm -hmm. to participate in the workforce. Okay. Is there a difference between permanently disabled and temporarily disabled? And how do you tell the difference? <laughs> <laughs> you know, this question actually um, comes up for me with my clients. And they come into my office and, and maybe they have uh, a child who's a, a teenager. And um, the teenager is uh, being very... Uh, irrational, maybe has had some learning disabilities, maybe um, maybe it's a daughter and the daughter has an eating disorder and uh, some depression and has really struggled in school and they're just not sure, you know, at that age they're not sure whether the daughter is going to uh, recover and be able to be a productive member of society or whether she's always going to need assistance. And so your question of, you know, permanent or temporary uh, disability. These clients come to me and say, well, I don't know that she's going to be disabled. I don't know if she'll be able to participate, you know, in the workforce and be able to be self-supporting. So I don't know if I should set up a special needs trust or if I should just have the assets go to her when I pass away. And what we typically look at is setting up a trust that has some flexibility in it so that if the person is disabled or at times that the person is disabled, it can function as a special needs trust so that the person can qualify for those needs-based benefits and we can have assets to pay for those extra items. But if the inv individual, the whole idea of paying for those extra items and doing the extra services is to help improve their situation and, and possibly if we have the special needs trust kicking in for maybe extra therapy, a special living environment where there is a um, maybe maybe not a regular roommate, but somebody who actually kind of keeps an eye on things and, and is supportive. Mm -hmm. um, you, you have a situation where you help to pay for these extra things and the person is a little bit more successful, a little bit more successful, and, and what do you know? You actually get to them to the point where they don't need the public benefits anymore. Mm -hmm. And so then what we have is a trust that can actually flip a switch and no longer function as a special needs trust and can just continue to hold the assets there for the benefit of the beneficiary who mm -hmm. had been disabled who might be disabled again. Mm -hmm. And then the years go on and maybe she hits midlife crisis or something goes terribly wrong and she takes another plunge. We can flip that switch again if the trust is set up that way and have it envelop those assets in a way that she can again qualify for public benefits. So we can set these trusts up for somebody who is um, never going to have capacity, who's permanently disabled, who's never going to be able to participate. We can also set them up in a way that is very beneficial and very helpful for somebody who may recover um, because it's a post-injury and they're going to be getting better over time. It's just going to take them two years, four years to get there. Or we can set it up so that uh, it accommodates somebody who may have cycles where they do better and then cycles where they fall off again. And we see that really all the time with the different mental illnesses like schizophrenia and uh, depression or bipolar. These types of things are very, very difficult situations to live with. And having a special needs trust to hold the assets to protect them from uh, being uh, having to be completely spent down 
before somebody can qualify for some benefits really makes a difference in the person's lives. Okay. Why would someone consider setting up a special needs trust? Well, as I've talked about, the special needs trust is going to protect those assets to allow somebody to qualify for benefits. If, if I had a child that, say, uh, was a um, chronic alcoholic or a chronic spendthrift who couldn't manage money, I would be really uncomfortable leaving an inheritance directly to that child because this this estate that I've worked so hard to build is going to be lost by that beneficiary's inability to manage the assets. That's a risk that I don't want to take with my estate. So one of the reasons that somebody would set up a special needs trust is to protect the assets because they're not able to just give them outright to the person that they want to have the uh, the benefit of those assets because that person's not able to manage them due to illness, due to disability, due to uh, drug and alcohol uh, or other behavioral situations. Uh, sometimes people think that they could just leave that money instead to uh, a family member. Say, um, say you had a brother who was uh, disabled and your mom didn't want to give the money to your brother so instead she says Mike this this five hundred thousand dollars is for your brother when I die this five hundred thousand dollars that is going to that I'm giving to you is not for you you are to take care of your brother with this five hundred thousand dollars well the risk of that is first of all there's no legal obligation for you to use the money that way and so you actually can do anything you want with that money all that your mother would have done is create a moral obligation for you to do the right thing and do what she wanted but there's no no legal way for your brother or anybody who's trying to protect your brother or act on behalf of your brother to enforce what your mother has tried to do by giving it to you the other risk of giving it to you is of course if it's owned by you then it's exposed to any creditors that you might have and right. as professionals we're always exposed to uh, liability so right. those are some of the reasons that somebody would give those assets instead of giving them outright to the individual or to another family member to hold on behalf of that individual why they would put them instead into a special needs trust and from, sorry, I am going to say one more because I haven't talked much about those first party special needs trust. And the reason somebody would use a first party special needs trust is if they have been diagnosed with a devastating illness, um, ALS, Parkinson's, MS, something that they are going to eventually die from but is going to cost a lot of money over the years to take care of them. Right. These self-settled special needs trusts allow us, if the person's not yet 65 years old, and if we meet a few other requirements, it allows us to take that person's assets and pick them up and put them into the trust to use for special extra things so they can qualify for benefits and keep these as additional resources um, to help pay for the extra necessities and oftentimes that is merely paying for like I said before dental work glasses it could be paying for extra care providers that are not covered by Medi-Cal in order to give the person the quality of life and allow them to live at home longer instead of having to go into an institution could even be for a trip to Disneyland it can be for a trip to <laughs> Disneyland you know the the rules on the special needs trust um, they're actually quite simple. The money in there can't be spent for anything that would have been covered by public benefits. Mm -hmm. So that means it can't be spent on food, shelter, medical treatment that would have been covered by public benefits. I've had clients who have used these funds to do exactly that allow have the beneficiary go on a vacation to Disneyland. And not only that, typically, these people are not able to travel alone. So the trust, assuming you have a trust with enough resources, the trust can actually pay for the companion to go with that person, whether that's a care provider, a family friend, uh, another family member maybe. Um, 
Mm -hmm. They're really tremendous, but those are our restrictions. So within that, we really have a lot of flexibility. It doesn't completely tie the money up the way 